being in power versus standing up to the powerful. Those demands may seem at cross purposes until you read the latest book written by former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould. Once a star cabinet minister for Prime Minister Trudeau, she is now one of the most vocal critics of his leadership and government. Her new book lays out why it's called Indian in the Cabinet, Speaking Truth to Power. And Jody Wilson-Raybould joins us now from Ottawa on that. It's good to see you again, Jody. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me, Steve. Nice to see you. Not at all. I'd love to start here with an excerpt from the book just to set up the discussion. You write, I had never belonged to a political party and did not really understand the world inside the Ottawa bubble and the realities of the politics of Parliament and how it truly operates. This was a practical knowledge I lacked, for better or worse, depending on your perspective. It would be a problem for the future as I had high expectations for people and for the institutions they were responsible to uphold. It was never a game to me, as it turns out it is for many. Let's just start there. I think maybe people don't appreciate the fact that you were not sort of a lifelong political animal who arrived in Ottawa with all this background knowledge, that in fact this was, in some respects, a colonial parliamentary system that was unknown to you. In which case, why did you choose to make the decision to enter this system in the first place? Well, I, I mean, it's a great it's a great question, and um, my I um, for uh, the better part of my my life, I have been an Indigenous uh, leader, elected um, leader. I moved from being the regional chief of the Assembly of First Nations for British Columbia and decided to enter federal politics for for many reasons, but. Um, probably primary among them was the need to create the space for Indigenous peoples in this country, Indigenous nations, to rebuild within a stronger Canada. And it was around um, the time uh, when Indigenous leaders, including myself, were frustrated with the previous government's lack of action, lack of creating the space for that transformative change, that I met Justin Trudeau. In fact, he came up to, to see me in Whitehorse in, in 2014 to encourage me to run. And, you know, I come from a, the, an Indigenous um, community. I have a very different worldview. As you stated, I mean, Indigenous um, politics does not have political parties. Um, that's not to say that we do not have divergent opinions among Indigenous peoples, but uh, we work through a process of consensus building um, to achieve like, goals, to, and particularly to improve quality of life for our people. So transitioning from the Indigenous world of politics to um, federal mainstream politics was was an eye-opener for me. And um, um, for better or for worse, I think it is for better in terms of uh, my worldview that looks to um, embrace different perspectives on issues and welcome different views on issues to, to create a space that we can come up with solutions that are are more long term that have more sustainability in terms of addressing major issues of our time. That was not uh, necessarily my experience when I I jumped into to federal politics, where there is a a very entrenched culture of partisanship and um, allegiance. Sometimes I describe as blind loyalty to a political party. Now I understand, but but before you saw that aspect of politics, which obviously you didn't like at all. You must have seen something in Justin Trudeau and or the Liberal Party that you found appealing enough because he courted you to run and you said yes. What was that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I reflect back and I talk about this in, in the book. I, at the time, in 2014, up to including in the very early years of, of the government, um, 2015 and on, um, there was great hope and great optimism. Uh, the, the words that were used a lot were about doing politics differently, being open and transparent. Um, I had lot, a number of conversations with Justin Trudeau back then about our vision for the country, about tackling major issues like climate change, creating that 
space for transformative change in terms of the relationship between gov governments and Indigenous peoples. So we were aligned on a lot of, of issues, including around conversations in terms of values, the values of equality and inclusion and working towards achieving justice for all individuals. These are values that I was raised on and still hold very close um, to this day. So there was alignment and, and the, the Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party, mostly Justin Trudeau, who presented himself to me was somebody that um, I believed in. And I believed in the vision that we were working collectively um, towards uh, in those early years. Well, if you want to see some proof of how much you believed him in, and I know you get tired of looking at this picture, but it's in your book. Okay, here's the cabinet swearing in. I mean, that was a lovely moment of Canada swearing in its first ever Indigenous Justice Minister. What were you thinking at that moment? Well, I mean, aside from uh, aside from my my knees knocking together and and being nervous, recognizing that um, the eyes of uh, many of the eyes of the country were were on me, I at that moment I felt tremendous pride. I was overcome with emotion in terms of what that moment meant, of course, to me and my family and, um, you know, more broadly than that, but in particular, what it meant um, to Indigenous peoples um, being sworn in as the first Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada that is Indigenous meant something. It meant something for the country in terms of how far we have come. Um, so I, you know, I had great hope and, and optimism. And, um, you know, a lot has transpired since that picture was taken to, to you and I talking. But I, I want to say I still have hope and I still have optimism. But it's that in between space in terms of the years um, and my experience within government and my experience with speaking up and speaking the truth that I, I sought to relay in this book in terms of lessons that I've learned, lessons um, in around how government operates and how we can work more diligently towards improving our system of government and good governance and moving away from partisanship. Um, so it's, I hope that um, through the writing of this book and telling of my story that um, um, others can, can learn from that and we can continue to improve as a country. Did you ever imagine that a few years after that quite lovely picture, you would say to that man, I wish I'd never met you? That's what you say in the book. I, 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 no, I never, I never thought that. I, I mean, I do talk about some warning signs in, in terms of some of the um, interactions and experiences that I had early on. Um, but I was, I was overcome with a desire to, to do uh, what we promised to do, to change the culture of politics, um, to be um, a government by cabinet. And, you know, I know I wasn't the only one in thinking back to the feeling uh, in 2015 and the people that were around me on my campaign. So many um, expressed that same sense of, of hope and that same optimism that we can actually engage in discussions in a in a different way so um you know talking about um that line in the book where i said to justin Trudeau that i wish i had never met him that's how i felt in the moment um but i i would not change um the experience i had almost six years being um, incredibly honored to have been the member of parliament for Vancouver Granville and for three of those years being a minister of the crown, um, an, an extraordinary honor um, by any measure. And I, I um, certainly look back on my experience and, and realize that everything happens for a reason. And I'm still the same person I was who decided to transition from indigenous politics to, to federal politics and getting involved, having more people from marginalized communities get getting involved matters because different voices matter. And uh, in terms of speaking up, I will continue to do that because um, we need more people to speak up because that's how our systems improve. Jody, uh, everybody remembers, of course, that your relationship with the PM fell apart over SNC-Lavalin. Uh, you were the Justice Minister and Attorney General at the time. Uh, you believed that he and his people were inappropriately trying to influence your independence that you felt you needed, and in fact, legally you had, uh, to do your job in the way that you did it. 
we don't need to relitigate the whole SNC Lavalin thing here, to be sure. But for those who don't understand the significance of what your concerns were, what exactly is the problem with a prime minister, a Montreal MP to boot, trying to use his good offices to try to make sure that a company that hires 9,000 people in the province of Quebec gets every break? Well, I mean, I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, and those are two very distinct roles. As the Attorney General, um, I am responsible, or the Attorney General is responsible for overseeing prosecutions in this country. And um, I um, understood my job very clearly. And um, while jobs are important and ensuring people have well-paying jobs is something that we all want to aspire to, there are basic fundamental tenets in our democracy, including having um, and the independence of the judicial system, independence of the prosecution, and as the Attorney General overseeing that and ensuring that there is no political interference in how um, one prosecutes particular cases um, underscores that and ensuring that the rule of law is upheld. Um, um, as if we were to diminish that, um, our country suffers. So um, I, it's incumbent upon any Attorney General to ensure that there is no political interference in um, the justice system, in the prosecution of any case. Um, that was my job. And the, the pressure that was um, exerted on me throughout that time around SNC was completely improper. Um, thankfully, um, certainly I knew my job and did not allow that um, any pressure to be placed upon me to ensure that I um, did my job and it held uh, um, the rule of law and the independence of uh, the justice system. Okay, fair enough. But you did tell Mr. Trudeau, and I read it in the book, when you decided to run for him and the Liberals, you said, I'm all in. And I wonder if you understood that when you say you're all in, it means you serve at his pleasure. You're not his equal. You work for him. Did you get that? I, I did. And I, I think that I, I mean, certainly I understand it is the prerogative of the prime minister to appoint uh, his ministers or her ministers. Uh, and as I said, I was greatly honored to be the minister of justice and the AG. Um, but I believe that ministers are placed and, and I truly believe the importance in the importance of government by cabinet and understanding and, and the nature of the job that we had um, as minister, but as the attorney general, I understood my job and I um, believe that it is important for ministers, for people to speak up when they see things um, that are wrong, when they see things that are sending the government down a dangerous path. It was my job to protect the government and to protect the prime minister from wrongdoing in terms of interfering with a prosecution. I would expect that any leader would look to their attorney general to do exactly the same thing. And certainly in terms of being a team, um, I uh, want to be on teams where people hold true to their values and principles, have integrity and speak up when something is wrong. And um, I will never ascribe to a politics where there is an assumption that being on a team or doing your job is doing what you're told um, by unelected people. Um, we're elected to represent Canadians and to do so with um, the utmost integrity and to represent their views on issues, not the views of certain people in our riding. So I would not change um, my approach approach to politics in that regard. And I think there's a lot that can be learned, um, you know, from different approaches, different worldviews where um, every person's uh, voice matters and decisions should be made on, on um, evidence, on um, experience, on what's best and what's right, not on what is politically expedient or what will um, ensure that we keep um, as many votes as possible. Um, I think that what is what, and I've heard 
what Canadians want and see as being positive leadership um, characteristics and values in, in politicians. At one point, you quote the PM saying to you, you, Jody, are challenging and infuriatingly headstrong, but that is why we love you. What did you infer from that when he said that? Well, I think, I mean, in, in retrospect and, and thinking about that, I, I think I, um, I, I mean, I took it as um, being good qualities for a minister and particularly as the attorney general in, in um, advocating for the issues, um, whether it be improvements to the justice system, uh, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples as being good characteristics in terms of advocating for the issues and the solutions that I was sent to Ottawa in the first place to address achieve um you know beneath that and the that is why we love you comment i um i know that there's underlying um elements of of misogyny and discrimination and um you know i'm very aware of of the the impact and the reality of different people's impressions of me um but uh i uh I said that I signed off my memos to the Prime Minister with, with that uh, um, infuriatingly headstrong but devoted MOJAG. And, you know, I was and continue to be devoted to um, advancing issues. I was when I was a member of, of Cabinet and I pushed really hard on um, the issues and the solutions um, particularly around Indigenous issues that I know have been around for a long time. I believe in the importance of keeping our promises. And what frustrated me and what made me push harder was when I saw us diverging away from not following through with what we said we were going to do. And um, I would do the exact same thing again. And obviously some people felt that I was pushing too hard and, you know, that's for them to, to think about. But uh, in terms of achieving what was promised, um, I would continue and I would have done the same thing over again, a hundred times out of a hundred. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Uh, we should just explain Mojag, your nickname, Minister of yeah. Justice and Attorney General. That's what that stands for. Now, I want to be careful how I ask this next question, because I, I want you to know, you. I mean, you and I know each other a little bit and we've done events together in the past. And you, I think you understand how much I respect you. But um, but I, I'm also going to ask this question uh, for two reasons. Number one, because I hear it from people, and I want you to be able to speak to the the allegation that I'm hearing from others out there about you. And, and well, let me just, I instead of so much setup, let me just ask it here. Would you allow for the possibility that Prime Minister Trudeau actually gave you a lot more latitude to be, and I use this word advisedly, insubordinate with him, perhaps more leeway to be that way than he might have given other cabinet ministers because of your indigenous background and because he understood that if he had a public confrontation with you, it wasn't the same as having a public confrontation with anybody else. Um, I mean, I think that in fairness is a question to, to ask the prime minister. I mean, I, uh, you know, I will be always grateful that he placed me in the position that he did and enabled me to achieve a significant amount uh, of good work and, and you know, pass laws, um, working with a, a team, um, as we did over many years. Um, and I, I believed that he brought me in um, for many reasons, of course, but um, because I hold a different worldview, because um, I am a proud Indigenous person and have uh, different ways of, of looking at, at issues and the world, recognizing our interconnectivity and, and our collective well-being is dependent upon our individual parts. Um, one of the things that um, uh, was extremely concerning that led, I believe, to the breakdown of relationships is that I um, believed coming into cabinet with different worldview and different perspective was important, not simply because one could say that I have an Indigenous person in the cabinet, but that my views, my experience, my expertise on issues would be listened to. And that simply did not turn out to be the case. Um, 
and and that is so unfortunate. It's unfortunate um, that we don't embrace different worldviews. That was my experience in in this cabinet to the place where um, I had a cabinet minister come up to me um, very early on and say, "You're the first Indigenous person." I've ever met in my life um, to being marginalized in terms of of my contributions around what we should be doing or the approaches we should take to Indigenous issues um, or that um, um, we simply know better than you. I mean, I experienced um, uh, marginalization based on racialized and gendered terms. I mean, this is something that I'm I'm very okay with speaking out about because I know that many individuals in their workplace experience this. It simply didn't have to be that way. How much rope or the prime minister gave me or enabled me to to speak out or that he didn't want to call me on things. I mean, that's, again, a question for him to decide. But I mean, the real value, and this applies across the board, um, in bringing people with divergent lived experiences into a political party or into cabinet, is if we actually embrace those experiences and recognize that a diversity of perspectives in terms of coming up with solutions to the major issues facing our time and that all of those views are important, um, not just symbolically, but in terms of contributing towards substance matter. That's not my experience within within Justin Trudeau's government. And it simply did not have to be that way. No, fair enough, but I'm I'm sure you've also heard the criticism, uh, which admittedly sounds a bit patronizing, but the criticism is, does she not get this as a team sport? He's the leader of the team. We all basically take our marching orders from him. And and it's and it's not, I mean, Parliament isn't beanbag, right? It's the it, it's it's brass knuckles, it's elbows up, and has been for 150 years. And if she thought that she was going to somehow transform it, uh, may have been a little naive on her on her part. You've heard that before, I presume, yes? Yeah, and I, and I write about um, you know people's perception in terms of uh, my being naive, and and if being naive is uh, feeling and knowing the importance of speaking up, um, speaking up against uh, you know entrenched uh, in institutions or the the culture of partisanship, blind loyalty, acting with integrity based on values and principles that you were raised with, if speaking up and doing that and, and expecting others to do the same is naive, then I'm okay with that, that title of, uh, I, I mean, coming into, into Parliament and knowing that you know, political parties are there. They have important roles. Um, that partisanship obviously is there. That people want to um, get into power and maintain power. Um, I understand that, but not at all costs. I believe that we need to be very um, open have our eyes wide open about the nature of our governing institutions, the challenges that our democracy is facing by the further entrenchment of political parties and blind loyalty. I do not believe that being part of a team means that you lose your voice or that you lose your independence. Being a member of a team, speaking one's mind, um, being thoughtful, um, representing your constituents, contributing to the dialogue and discussion, even if it's different from the prime ministers or unelected people in the prime minister's office, is why we are elected and sent to parliament. We need to, in my view, um, and the election uh, yesterday um, is, is a reflection of this. I mean, we have a minority government situation again. And I think that's a message from Canadians, um, another message that we need to work together, um, not divide, but work across party lines to actually address the major issues facing our time. Um, Simply because something um, is the way that it is doesn't mean that it's the best way to govern 150 plus years um, and it's changed over time um, doesn't mean that our institutions do not need to be revitalized. They do. 
I wrote a book about my experience in terms of how good ideas, no matter where they come from, are quelled by the reality of um, the need to achieve power. That's wrong. Political expediency and making decisions based on that um, does not help our democracy. It does not address the issues that we face, whether it be climate change or doing the right thing um, for Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, we need to examine that. And anybody that says um, this is the way it is and this is the way it will always be, I reject that outright. Oh, I know. Uh, it's a uh, really good read. Indian in the Cabinet, Speaking Truth to Power. Jody Wilson-Raybould has been our guest. Uh, I hope you sell a million copies. It was really an enjoyable read. And uh, good luck with whatever comes next. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate always talking to you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.